of the Delling Pods with me, James Delling Pod, and I'm very excited about this week's special guest. He's uh, a businessman, a racing driver, and he's about to do something really wonderful, which we should also support. He is, is launching a crowdfunding, a judicial review against the British government, arguing that their their lockdown is unlawful. Welcome to the to the Delling Pod, Simon. Um, and congratulations on doing what I think a lot of us have been. Well, actually, I say a lot of us. It's not true, is it? I mean, half the country at the moment, more than half the country, seems to want to stay in lockdown forever. Yeah. Hi, James. It, it's strange, isn't it? I must admit, I didn't think that when I started this, it would be quite such a, a divisive issue. You know, in my mind, I thought that the vast majority of people would be, you know, let's go back to work. We need to we need to get out of this. Um, but I must admit, just the last, I would say the last two days, uh, you know, most of the death, threat, death threats have stopped. And the time... <laughs> I, I'm serious. Uh, most You're of the, not. No, 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 seriously. Yeah, I've had death threats. Um, no, no, nothing serious, just, you, you know, your average Twitter, Twitter troll. Um, but the, the time does seem to have turned, I've, I've noticed. And, and whether it's anything to do with what, what I'm doing or, or not, I don't know. It, it just seems to have shifted the last two or three days or so. So now I'm getting an awful lot more messages of support and, and the, the trolls and the, and the kind of, you know, the, the histrionics from the, let's face it, Marxists are, um, uh, are, are really petered off to almost nothing. So it, it, it's good, actually. It's restored my faith in the, in, uh, in the British people, I must admit. Well, my, my faith in the British, British people was at a fairly all-time low, actually, I must say. I, I, I always imagined that the Blitz spirit had survived the Second World War and lasted into 2020, and that, that, that the British people had a kind of special character, a kind of a mix of stoicism and bloody-mindedness and, and a, a sort of hatred of arbitrary authority. And all that has been very much called into question by the public response to... To, to the lockdown. I mean, I don't know whether you've seen, but the British people apparently are more scared about coronavirus than any other people on earth. I mean, that's not something to be proud of, is it? No, I think it's something to be very scared about. And, uh, you know, I thought the same as you. I, I thought British people had, um, you know, more of a backbone and more of a, like you say, more of a desire to get up and get going and fight in the face of uh, adversity. But it, I, I do believe they've been completely manipulated, completely manipulated. And it was interesting, since we started this um, case, all of a sudden they started releasing some of the sage notes. Uh, not all of them by any means. You know, there's a lot that have been redacted or statistically not put out at all. But there was one that was put out, I think, yesterday. And it was from their behavioural people, in uh, in the sage group and, uh, and it was saying basically about how you could scare the population in, into complying with these rules and, and one of the uh, one of the lines i saw was and i'm quoting now the perceived level of personal threat needs to be increased using hard-hitting emotional messaging and that's <laughs> you know it's uh well you know we all know how nazi germany started and it's um you know, it's not far off this, is it? You know, it's freedom of speech going one day, freedom of movement, manipulation of population, propaganda. So, um, yeah, that, that made me, you know, this isn't the reason I did it, but that made me even more kind of determined to see this through to the end and to, um, uh, and to show the government that, you know, there are at least some of the British people that have got the spirit and, and the backbone and they can't just get away with anything. You know, this is extraordinary times, not extraordinary, even unique. You know, even in the war, people weren't locked up. And they, like you just said, you that's, know, people, that's right. people have been, um, uh, you know, just sleepwalked, I suppose, into, uh, into sitting at home and, and begging to stay at home, some of them. Um, but like I say, it's turning. And, and I think this, this bizarrely timed uh, news about Neil, Neil Ferguson yesterday... <laughs> Um, no, I mean, that's a whole subject. Well, I'll let you take that because I'll I, I enjoy talking about well, it. Well, no, I, Simon, do you not think that the the Neil, I've, I've just written a piece about this for Breitbart, that the Neil Ferguson sex scandal revelations 
really are couldn't have come at a better time because let's face it people people like you and me might be interested in 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 details like how the how the government's nudge unit it's a, a propagandizing us and and how and how the the imperial college study that the modeling is 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 suspect but that's quite esoteric for most of the population whereas i think there are lots of people out there who can relate to the story this bloke is a devious shagger he's bonking he's bonking uh somebody else's wife okay in an open marriage but uh He's supposed to be on lockdown. He's agitating for lockdown. And instead, here he is breaking the lockdown so he can have a shag. Now, I think that may move people against him far more strongly than his appalling record as a modeler. Uh, sadly, again, I think so. Um, it, it's just personalities, this thing, isn't it? It's got nothing to do with the data. It's got nothing to do with the science. It's got, you know, you've got uh, this uh, scientist, and I, and I put inverted commas, uh, you know, those little finger ones, um, when yes. I say that, uh, who's come up with his modelling. Uh, but he was he was being put up as the um, the, the genius, you know. And uh, people believe the story. You know, he had little glasses and he looked like a scientist and that was what everybody based their, um, uh, their models on and the lockdown on and so on. So, you know, that was a very easy um, image to portray in the media, wasn't it? And then you've got Boris rallying his, uh, his inner Churchill and Blitz spirit and just a few more weeks and, oh, you know, all the rest of the stuff that he's coming out with. And now all of a sudden, coincidentally, I mean, obviously, there's absolutely nothing other than coincidence involved in this. The main protagonist, the main guy in this has gone from being the hero um, to being caught with his pants down. And, uh, you know, mm. if, we, if we were cynical by nature, and, and I know neither of us are, we might think that that was he was being thrown under the bus somewhat. Oh my goodness! Do you know what? I am actually that naive and innocent and sweet-natured that that hadn't actually occurred to me. But now you mention it, if <laughs> one were to construct a kind of a thriller, and the government realised that they had made the most terrible mistake in relying on the computer modelling of of somebody who turned out to be extremely dodgy and suspect and and also who was being shown by for example the real world evidence from sweden that his modeling did not did not accord with with real world data then i would agree that you would need some kind of way of ensuring that this guy was discredited so that you could you could then have an excuse to move away from him and and perhaps choose a different a different model, a bit like like he chose. He seems to like choosing different models. Um, no, but is, is, is that is that kind of at the back of your mind? Is that is that what you suspect has happened? Well, now you now you put the thoughts in my head. I mean, it wasn't. But, uh... <laughs> you blame me. Look, you, you gave me the thought, thought for. I just I just ran with your idea, <laughs> but it's a good one. It is, isn't it? It's certainly, it's certainly worth developing at, at some stage, assuming that um, you know, assuming he ever does get before some sort of uh, committee. But uh, you know, who knows? It, it's I suppose we can uh, we we can sort of laugh and debate about that all day long, um, and it is funny in in a lot of respects. I do hope that he isn't Epstein. Um, I do hope he doesn't try and commit suicide by slashing at his left wrist or anything like that. Um, that's a David Kelly reference, which you look that one up. And, yes, yes, um, no, I, I, I got that. <laughs> although, although, do you know what? I do think that, yes, you, of course we don't wish wish suicide or anything else on him. Nevertheless, there is definitely something about the weapons of mass destruction, isn't there, about, about coronavirus? I mean, tell me about your coronavirus journey of enlightenment, because I'll tell you, I'll tell you where I was first. In about... Uh, where was it? Um, sort of early to mid March. I was. I'd been. I'd. I'd spent two months reading the stuff coming out of China, and reading about bodies being being sort of burnt, piled up in the streets, and being and these mysterious pyres emitting sulphur dioxide at night. And and I'd I'd heard translations of recordings of people trying to get their get get grievously ill people into hospital and being told that all the doctors and nurses were either you know dead or 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 incapacitated with coronavirus 
And I thought I thought for a moment this is our new spa this is the new Spanish flu. This is the this is the the pandemic Armageddon that we've been warned about, you know, once in a century. And so I was quite nervous initially, but there then came a point I, I, because it's a fast moving story, as I discussed with my friend Aidan Hartley the other day, that 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 it's it's very hard to keep up with the with the changing evidence from around the world, but you have to if you want to keep on top of it. And it became fairly clear, I think, before the lockdown, that this was not as deadly a, a, a virus as, say, the Spanish flu, which actually w would sometimes kill people within 24 hours of them or 12 hours of, of, of them showing the first symptoms and which attacked young people particularly. So so it attacked the, the, the group that we most fear dying, our, our children and the, and the young, the, the really productive sector of the economy. But this clearly isn't the case. And I was wondering, did you go through a similar a, a similar trajectory? Yeah, I think our minds probably work in, in the same sorts of ways. You know, I, I, I mistrust any kind of news headline. Um, it doesn't really matter yes. where, where it comes from. And so I, I always look at these things with, a, with an eye on its sensationalist. And, and we know, you know, most, no, not most, almost all journalism has an eye on clickbait. You, know, you look at newspaper news headlines now. Uh, you know the kind of broadsheets, uh, the tabloids, or whatever. They're all clickbait, and so I do look at it like that. And I do remember clearly. I was in London uh, just before it could be the end of end of February, I, I guess. I am there every month just on business and stuff. And all anybody spoke about at the time was this virus thing. Um, and I remember saying, but, you know, nothing's going to happen. Um, they had it in China. There was a few deaths. You know, we've got way more hygiene and everything than China. And therefore, everything will be OK. Just crack on. And actually, it was quite nice. You know, London was quiet. Um, you didn't have to shake hands with everybody you met. It, it was all fine. But I do remember coming home and saying to my wife, Jesus, I, I just don't want to hear about this bloody thing again. And of course, that was, uh, that was what, two months ago now, and, uh, and all hell's broken, broken loose since then. So, yeah, then when you look at the, you know, the stats, and they're very easy, isn't it, to get embroiled in the numbers because they're published everywhere. And you go, my God, you know, this, this is actually quite nasty. There are quite a few people dying of it. And then you see the awful sights in Italy. Um, you know, it, it's uh, terrible. But then when you saw in America, for example, when they were reusing images from Italian hospitals and pretending that they were in New York, and then when you realize that actually the, uh, the um, I'm not sure, the Department of Health maybe, who uh, tell doctors how to diagnose cause of death, are telling them to put COVID-19 on. Basically, if, if they, even if they suspect it, you know, if, um, if they have symptoms of, of COVID, then you should put that on the death, death certificate. Well. One of the symptoms of COVID is shortness of breath. And you'd struggle to find a dying person that wasn't short of breath, would you? So you think, well, well <laughs> the death numbers must be, must be exaggerated. Well, then why on earth are they exact? Why would you do that? Well, and then it comes back to instilling fear. You know, and it goes back to that quote that I read out earlier about, um, you know, hard hitting messages. And you think, no, actually, we've been manipulated here. So let's try and get to some real data. And then you start looking at, OK, then, well, if they, they can't fake people dying, you know, so you start looking at, well, what are, the, what are the rates of overall deaths? And actually, up until the end of March, the average deaths uh, this year were less than the average for the previous five years. Uh, and April, of course, has kicked that over the edge well. So I'm of the opinion now, obviously, there, there is something nasty that's knocking about. Um, and it's killing people. And individual stories, of course, are tragic. It does still remain the fact that there's only, well, whatever the number, you know, 650 people under the age of 65 that have died of it. And I think of, of those, only 10% didn't have some really nasty pre-existing conditions. So, so not to, to kind of, you know, lighten those deaths in any way. Um, at some point, you have to say, look, you know, this lockdown really hasn't worked. It's not done what it's supposed to do. We need to get out of this because there are people dying now, committing suicide. There's women getting beaten up and children being killed in abusive homes. Um, and we're storing up debt of untold you know, quantities. I think that actually, I think it's not untold. The, uh, after the Second World War, America, sorry, the UK borrowed 
uh, whatever it was, you know, $2 trillion in today's money from the US. They finished paying that off, I think, two or three years ago. And that's kind of where we are. You know, it's catastrophic. So you think, well, okay, you know, nothing we can do about what's happened. No one's, uh, there's no point. You know, there'll be an inquiry, but that'll be three years down the line. It's just utterly useless. So what can you do? You know, what can I do now to try and do something about it? And on the one hand, it's good that in the UK, the judiciary and the government are quite separate. You know, in France, you couldn't do what I'm doing um, because they're too tight knit. But you do need a lot of money to be able to start these things. You know, the, the crowdfunding is uh, is lovely, but it's it's probably you know even at seventy odd thousand we've raised at the moment, it's probably ten percent of what it's likely to cost if we go for judicial review. So, you know, it, it, it's nice that there's an avenue open, uh, but it, it shouldn't really just be for people that have got hundreds of thousands of pounds to throw at it. So it, it's been an interesting so, journey. So you, you're, you reckon you need to raise 700,000 to to make it work, to get, get a, a decent judicial review, is that right? That, that would be what it would probably cost. If we won, yeah. um, then it would be a lot less than that because you know we would be awarded costs um, if we lost, it would be you know a bit more than that because we would have to pay their costs. Um, but it, it, we're not going to get there on the crowdfunding, that's for sure. Which and the crowdfunding was kind of an adjunct. It was something I when I started this, I was just going to do it on my own. Um, I got in touch with the barrister, yeah. and sympathetic, and and that was it. I was just going to do it. And then someone got in touch, uh, a lady called Erica, who's who's uh, who's got a company down south, and uh, and she she put some money in, quite a lot of money in. And then uh, she said, well, I've got some friends who, who might like to donate. And originally they were going to donate through the lawyer. And then the lawyer said, well, look, I, you know, we can't do it. But why don't you set up one of these crowdfunding things? Now, that was where that came about. So there's been an awful lot of, um, you know, abuse <laughs> on uh, on Twitter and so on. And Oh, yes. You, you've got to tell me. Tell me do, I, can you read out these 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 threats you had? What, tell me what do people say? Oh, it, it's it's uh, none of them are particularly um, uh, imaginative. Uh, I got called a grade A throbber, which one of my friends pointed out. Oh, may have what? Been, a grade A throbber? Yeah, one of my friends pointed out that may have actually been a, a compliment. So I was looking at it the wrong way. Equally, when someone called me a donkey, she said exactly the same thing. So, you know, maybe they are compliments after all. I don't know. Um, but they're all along the lines of, you know, this guy's got 142 million and he's sat in Monaco and he wants your money to fund his vanity project. You know, it's that kind of thing. Um, yes. And it's like, oh, I have answered that question like 40,000 times. So um, I just left the tweet up there and that was that. But that was the that was the real gist of the, you know, the whole, the argument against me because, it, it, you know, it's crowdfunded. It's really not crowdfunded. It's, uh, it, they're very welcome. And what's m more lovely actually is just seeing the, the, the comments on the, uh, on the crowdfund website, crowd justice um and it's like two and a half thousand i think now but they're all really nice you know just someone with 10 pounds or five pounds or whatever they're saying you know i can't afford much but i'm really happy you're standing up for us that's lovely actually you know it's really really nice gives you a warm fuzzy feeling and makes it all worthwhile i i, I still th i think one of the reasons you're going to get a lot of warmth from those who are on board with your with your crowdfunding is that at the moment we still are very much in the way of being an oppressed minority. We've got this this government imposing this stuff on us and and propagandizing us, as you say, something rotten. Um, and, and 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 the media, unfortunately, are are also propagandizing us. I mean, I mean, the way I, I think the media's performance in this has been very disappointed. The way that they fill the papers with with the kind of the, the tragic moving personal stories of people who are dying horribly well you think about how many people die tragically movingly and horribly every year without the coronavirus their stories never get told in the newspapers but suddenly suddenly we're, we're, we're we have to have our faces rubbed in the the gory horrors of 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 coronavirus and i thought i saw one of my favorite favorite journalists i think it was yeah dominic lawson you are you, are you a fan of his Dominic uh -huh. Lawson, who is normally really, really solid and sound. And one of the arguments he advanced as to why we should take coronavirus seriously was, get this, 
that it was an unpleasant way to die. Well, uh, <laughs> show me a pleasant. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's the nice way of dying? Yeah, because that's the way I want to go. I mean, I, I, presumably it's on on morphine or something like that. But but I was thinking generally underneath a group of hookers on drugs. I was thinking that. Yeah. That, well, that's a, yeah, that's yours is even better, and I I feel <laughs> an idiot now not having thought of it. But you you get where I'm coming from. That 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 those of us who can see through all this very much feel like the little boy who's looking at the emperor the naked emperor and and, th- and and just astonished that not everyone else is recognizing that he is actually naked and 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 why can't they see it it's just ridiculous so i think you are appealing to a, a particularly angry frustrated constituency right now and uh, so i'm uh, you know well done well done for doing that i also think by the way that crowdfunding is a good idea not as you say you probably don't need the money but but what what it does is it raises your publicity profile. Yeah, and I think you know obviously the 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 uh, the government solicitors will be looking at all this stuff. It's nice that they can see that there's an outpouring of, you know, it's all very well getting a like on Facebook or, or you know or Twitter or something. But it, when someone actually has to put their hand in their pocket, uh, you know, they go and get their credit card and fill the details in and actually pay money. You know that that is actually a very telling sign. Um, that there is a, um, uh, you know, there is public opinion behind this. Um, where, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's had that, it's had a secondary benefit, which I think is actually greater than, than as you say, the monetary value. So what have your lawyers, I mean, I, I imagine a lawyer is never going to say, oh, we haven't got a chance, mate, of winning this case, because <laughs> that wouldn't, that's not how law works. But, but tell me, what, what have they said about, about, how much chance do you stand of, of holding the government to account and winning this one? Well, the good news is I think we've already held the government to account or we are already holding the government to account because this, I think I said to the lawyers, you know, this is plays out in the media. It will be one in the media. It won't be one in the courtroom necessarily. Right. The, the actual legal challenge is is threefold. Um, and one of them are not, is not particularly interesting. It just comes whether they've actually ultra virus, which to be honest with you, I, I guess it means outside of the law, but I've not really researched it that much because it's dull. Um, but that's the one tact. The the second tact is whether it's proportionate. You know, so they do have it measures in emergencies to impose certain things, but they have to be proportionate to the threat. So was it proportionate to start off with? And is it still proportionate? You yeah, know, that's telling. Um, and thirdly, whether they, whether it's just a breach of a basic English law, interestingly, not England and Wales, not the UK, but an English law of the right to enjoy uh, private property peacefully. In terms of winning, you know, it's the government are going to struggle to defend it vigorously on the legal grounds. However, the it's it's not the legality particularly; it's the magnitude of what we would be asking the judges to do. You know, overthrowing the biggest restriction of, you know, liberty ever. Um, and so if there is a way for them to get out of doing that, then they probably would. So it's more we're up against the perception, I think, than the or the, or the magnitude of what's happened than we are up against particularly difficult legal arguments. You know, this is not, we're not wriggling around on a technicality here. It, it's, it's really quite fundamental. So what the chances yes. are, you know, then that really comes down to, um, to, the, to the judges and, and, and what they think. Now, you know, the good thing is, is that they're all in thinkers. They're not political animals, you know. So we'd, we'd like to think that when we present the case, it will be looked at um, completely independently. And, and they'll come to the conclusions that, you know, I really think they have to. Certainly on one point that it's out of all proportion to, uh, to the threat, you know. Yeah. Uh, out of interest, where were you on on Brexit? Were you a Brexiteer or a Remainer? No, I, I I thought that Brexit was a was a totally good idea, very badly done, still being badly done. Um, there's no those coincidental timings, isn't it? Um, I think Britain was was well better off outside the EU. You know, for me, small government is always better than big government. There has never yes. been a time in history where that hasn't happened. You know, that hasn't been true. Um, and look at it now, you know, by the skin of their teeth, uh, the UK have, have, have got out of uh, have got out of Europe, and now look what a mess Europe's in. You know, they're, they're finished. I, yes. think, I believe the EU is now finished. 
I can't see any solution other than for um, individual countries, Italy, for example, to go back to the lira or whatever currency they want and to just simply default on the EU debt. You know, and if Italy goes, France is going to go socialist. I mean, 100 percent. Macron tried to take it the other way and do a bit of a Maggie Thatcher, uh, failed miserably and thought, well, if I'm going to hold on to power, you know, I just need to I just need to go socialist. So the industries will be nationalized. Um, uh, you know, what is there left? What is it? What is there left for France? Germany can't hold it all up. Um, and so I think it will just I think it will just go. The UK, I think, stands a, a good chance of, of not exactly roaring back, but of, of limping along um, reasonably well. If they do, a, <laughs> yes, I think. You know, if they do a trade deal, I, in the US, it needs to happen. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm going to go with this digression for a bit because it's quite interesting. But but a, a friend of mine um, who's a financier tells me that he thinks that the euro could just collapse. That it could be the end of the euro. Uh, I don't know what you think about that. It's very difficult to see how it won. Who's going to who's going to pay the debt back? I mean, we saw what happened with Greece, you know, and, and that was a that was a mess to say the least. If if a country do you do currency trading? No, 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 I don't. I don't. No, I mean, no, you because I, I know a lot of a lot of serious people with serious money, they don't like going outside their comfort zone. They only like investing in what they know and understand and care about, and they're very reluctant to. I, I'm guessing you're one of those. I, I invest in businesses because I understand them, and businesses I can can influence. Uh, I don't invest in the stock market. I don't let other people invest my money. Uh, it's just what I can see and, and touch. You know, that, that's all. That's, it's not to say it's the right. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask you about your business career in, in a moment. But I, but I, 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 I like your analysis of that, that the European, continental Europe is going, is going down the pan. But anyway, back to, back to Brexit. So you were a Brexit. You, you were basically rooting for Brexit, even though you, you thought that there that, that it was being handled unsatisfactorily. Is that about roughly where you were? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When, when I say handled unsatisfactorily, yeah. I, I don't mean by, by Gina Miller and all her stuff, but I just simply mean by the way in which they negotiated it. You know, I think Theresa May was, a, was an embarrassment. Yes, of course. Mm. Yeah. No, I'm just I'm just trying to get a handle on on your politics. And, and you're you're presumably a bit like me, a sort of classical liberal with maybe a bit of a, a a libertarian streak you you believe in in free markets fervent supporter of ayn rand and objectivism uh um, ah yes wouldn't, yeah, it be lovely if, wouldn't it be lovely if we if we could deal with john gall and uh, hank reardon in real life unfortunately i think that was what ayn rand got wrong was that she you know you can't use that system in in a world that we that we have but ironically, you know, the, the whole uh, John Galt stopped the motor of the world. The bloody virus did it, didn't it? <laughs> so we are in a yes, sense. Well, it did. Well, <laughs> let's talk economics for a moment. I mean, have you lost, is, is your net worth down as a result of this of this crisis? I, I would must say. Be, mustn't it? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to give a... Uh, a reasoned response. I think the knee jerk is yes, and I think the reasoned response is yes, simply because I believe that asset prices around the world have probably dropped thirty percent, maybe forty percent, and I mean every asset, you know, homes and businesses, and yeah, so on and so forth. The uh, that the, much thirty or forty percent. I think it's got to be. If you if you had to sell your house in the UK now, yeah, who, yeah. who would buy it? You know. Whether it's going to recover or not is another thing. Um, well, it will recover, but when it recovers, is it going to take five years or 50 years? Um, so, yeah, uh, without doubt, I think everybody has lost uh, has lost worth. But then, of course, it becomes relative, doesn't it? You know, if everybody's lost worth, worth lost wealth, then you're all in the, kind of the same position. Yes, but isn't it interesting how few people in Britain have been alive to the argument, we're killing our economy. Your jobs are going to be seriously at risk. Your children are not going to have jobs. We are we are absolutely toast. And and and, and people have gone, you know, the, the, the generality of the populace have gone, la la la, we're enjoying the sunshine. It's been a, it's been an un, unseasonally hot or a, 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 an uncharacteristically hot 
hot April and we've been enjoying our time at home with our families. And hey, that nice chancellor, Rishi Sunak, who we love, has been paying us furlough with, with free money from the magic money tree. So it's all all right. Has that shocked you? Yeah, I mean, I must admit, I was really disappointed in in Rishi when I um, first came across him. It wasn't that long ago, you know, maybe six months ago. I thought he was probably, you know, sort of headed for the top. Really bright guy, speaks really well, um, seemed to be very um, uh, congruent, you know. Um, and then he started doing a Harold Wilson, you know. He's just, I don't yes. know what happened. I, I guess there's the kind of well, what did you expect him to do? But and when he'd gone down the path of saying, well, you know, here's 330 billion to make sure that no business in the UK goes bust. Oh, okay. And then you see the other, you know, special interest groups that are coming up and saying, well, what about us? What about us? Well, what about us? Well, actually, we need wages paying as well. Oh, God, okay. Well, yeah, you can have some. And so you've got this ludicrous situation where anybody now who puts their hand up is being dished out money. You know, the, the bounce back loan, they're dishing money out within 24 hours. And what they don't say, of course, really, is, is it, it, Rishi paints it as it's interest free, it's capital free, don't pay us anything back. Little asterisk, small print for 12 months, and then it's two and a half percent interest. So the mountain of debt, I mean, it's just going to be astronomical in 12 months' time from, you know, from people who now need to pay their VAT, their PAYE, their rent, their mortgage, their business loan back, at a point where businesses are probably possibly just about getting back on their feet. So my worry for the economy is, is not so much, you know, immediately. It, my worry is in you know, 12 or 15 months' time. But general, generally speaking, people don't have a massive grasp on economics. And as you say, the the... You know, the general population is just going to be going, well, you know, this furlough thing is fantastic because, uh, you know, I'm not in, uh, I haven't got my job now because of this uh, invisible silent killer from China. But um, I will have it back because, uh, you know, <laughs> I might, my wages are guaranteed. So it's lovely. Um, and I'm doing my bit for the country, you know, because I go out and clap every Thursday without fail. Every Thursday. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I think you're in yes. a- Right, so right. where where is the so you you reckon about a, a year's time is when it's all going when the shit's going to hit the fan economically well, I mean yeah yeah I, th- I think that's when the the second <laughs> that's the second wave nothing to do with his bloody uh, yes country, you know. <laughs> um so and, and it's going to come when people are going to finally be forced to borrow some money for it because they're going to have massive cash flow problems aren't they. And they're going to need to borrow. But where are they going to be able to borrow from? And at what at what interest rate? I would imagine that what will happen is, is the, um, the the banks will have to package up. And I'm not quite sure of who is going to be left holding the can here. I suspect it's um, I suspect it's the government. These latest bounce back loans, I think, are 100 percent backed by the, the government, aren't they? And the other ones were 80 percent backed. So I would imagine what will happen is there's going to be enormous bad debts and then they're going to be hived off into a bad debt bank um, and then just written off, uh, I guess. But, uh, you know, right. cost, um, I, I've no idea. I, I've no idea. Um, you know, that's we says, know, don't we, that, that be- before before this 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 pandemic, there were a lot of zombie businesses which had been a kept kept alive by artificially low interest rates, by central bank in- intervention, quantitative easing, and uh, and so on. We we know that this was this was a boom that had that had been kept on life support machine by by market manipulation by the banks and governments because they didn't want the they, they didn't want a, a, a recession. They wanted an endless boom. I suppose all politicians do. Um, but now here is that kind of market correction. But instead of allowing bad businesses to fail, uh, Uncle Rishi, Rishi Santa, Santa Claus Rishi, with his with his big big sack of, of goodies, is keeping them all alive. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. You know, there were zombie businesses beforehand, and, uh, and now, God, I suppose you, know, you, you didn't really have zombie small businesses, did you? 
Um, so now you're not going to have you know. You're no, have, you didn't. You, you have zombie companies, but you're also going to have zombie people and zombie one man bands that are limping along, just about managing to pay enough um, to pay the interest on their magic free money. And uh, you know, and eventually, at what point do they just go enough is enough? Um, and then, of course, when yeah, three or four yeah, of them, yeah. then um, there's no personal guarantees on these bounce back loans, and the uh, and, and the um, the majority, I think, of the uh, of the government back loans, there's no personal guarantees, and so you know, why wouldn't you just say I, I can't afford to pay it? Sort of. <laughs> if enough people so do. Have you, as as a kind of in businesses? Have you thought about the kind of world that is going to emerge from this from this crisis? What do you think, out of interest, what businesses are going to we're going to have more of, and what are going to be find it more difficult to, um, in the future? It's, it's probably easier to pick the ones that are going to have a hard time, isn't it? You know, uh, the big loser I think is going to be commercial property. I mean that's uh, that market has just been blown apart. Not not pure, not only because of the uh, the fact that no one's paying their rent anymore, but of course because of the fact that people now realise that they can work at home, um, and that yeah. they're trusted and they're efficient. And you know, why, why should you be paying a huge amount of rent to be in uh, in West London, for example, uh, when people can work at home? So everybody be downsizing, and that of course has a downward uh, drive on uh, on rental yield. Most of the uh, commercial property is owned by pensions, and so that will have a downward yield on pensions. So there you are, there's another uh, black hole you could disappear down. Um, I think the companies that will, that, that will do well, uh, I've thought a lot about this. Health, obviously, is going to be a big sector. Uh, wearable tech, I think. You know, so everybody now is primed um, to be on the lookout for this silent, invisible killer from China um, or whatever the next thing is. So health tech, I think, is is going to have a big uptick. Um, the working at home type stuff, whatever that might be, uh, you know, that's going to have a big uptick. Uh, what else? It's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult to think of, you know, online businesses. I guess esports, you know, as 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 much as I hate that, um, I guess that will have a um, that will have an uptick. But how? You know, I love motor racing and. Uh, to, to watch the guys playing computer games online and, and, and thinking that it's in some way interesting. And, and it's interesting to do. You know, I've been on plenty of sims. It's quite interesting to do. But as, as a spectator sport, geez, it's so... Uh, it's not live, is it? You know? except, except, Simon, I was reading recently that Max Verstappen has been spending all his, all his downtime doing simulated motor racing games on his computer because that's what the, that's what kids of his age do so uh yeah you know, it, max, it's, max it's is, what it's what keeping max's racing spirit alive max is my next one pretty much my next door neighbor and max goes on sims all the time anyway. all the time anyway he's these, these guys at lando's lando norris is another guy they spend all their spare time on sims anyway it's not nothing to do with the lockdown they uh, you know they'll go and do a, a race weekend and then they'll be on the sim in the evening and uh, and during the next week so this is what they do you know they love it. it's why they're so good i've got to ask you about your about your le mans you actually won you you won the le mans didn't you mm. or you won a category in le mans yeah, I, won- I, I don't really understand how le mans works no it's a bit complicated but we won won the uh, lmp2 class which is the second fastest class. So you have the kind of manufacturers, the Audi and the, uh, I forgot who was there then, Audi, Peugeot, uh, Toyota. Uh, so they're all for the manufacturers spending you know, 150 million a year on it. And then the tier below that is the kind of privateers, as it were. And that was the one that we won. So we, yeah. we won our category and we came fifth overall, which was, which was a pretty big achievement, actually. Those were the well, so do you, do you mean you built a, your own car like like a, a sort of from different components you, you weren't a kind of you know you weren't bmw or you weren't whatever is that no, how it works? So, so the uh, the 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 fastest category those are the guys that build their own cars hence the really high budgets and then in, in our yeah. category lmp2 you you'd buy a, a car buy a chassis and then you do your thing yeah. to it so you have a base chassis and then you would do the setup and you do all the stuff that you do um so yeah that's how that works and you, and and you then drive around this track for 24 hours. Yeah, three drivers. So you'll yeah. do typically a stint, which is how long you take before you come in for fuel, 
was about 42 yeah. minutes. So we would do anywhere between two and four stints. So you could be in the car, you know, three and a half hours, I suppose, maximum. Um, typically, you'd be in for what? probably an hour and a half at a time. So, so in, t- in total, in 24 hours, how, how, how long are you, are, you, are you driving for? About eight hours. Eight, well, yeah, I suppose that would make sense. Three eight to twenty four. Yes, three drivers. Yeah. Okay. So, and and how do you stay awake? Are you are you drinking Red Bull or or doing cheeky lines of coke or what? <laughs> it's actually drug tested motorsport, so no, you can get away with that. People have got caught, but no, it's amazing. You can be. So what happens is when you get out of the car, you, you, you try and have a bit of a shower and you get a massage and stuff, and then you go and get something to eat, and then you go and go to sleep in your hut or wherever you've got. Uh, just next to the track and then someone will knock on your door um, and they go right it's half an hour before you need to be in the car and you, you just the adrenaline you just get up and you, maybe you've had 30 minutes sleep or an hour sleep or something so you go from being asleep in your in your little hut to half an hour later being rattling down three o'clock in the morning on the Molsan straight doing 200 mile an hour with all sorts of other traffic and stuff about you and the, the, it's the adrenaline it keeps you going and it's funny then, oh you know, my god after after the race because you've been up for you know probably the best part of 36 40 hours 36 40 hours something like that um and then when all the adrenaline's died off and obviously the race is finished and stuff like that and it gets to be seven o'clock or eight o'clock in the evening or something and then you're done you're absolutely dead i actually fell asleep when i was eating once <laughs> it's uh, it does hit me. And, and did you did you do um sleep training beforehand i mean it must be quite an art going to sleep for half an hour an hour when you're kind of pumped up with adrenaline and nerves or whatever no you can't really do that because if you imagine imagine you were you were fast asleep you just gone to bed you know you've gone to bed at 11 11 p.m uh and then you get woken up at i don't know let's say 1 p.m uh hearing a noise downstairs you know, you don't then think, oh, God, I've got, to, I've got to get out of bed. Oh, no, I think I'll have another five minutes. You just leap up and you rush downstairs, don't you? And it's just adrenaline. That, that's how it works. You, you can't really rev up. Right. Um, and how, um, how old were you when you did this? When we won, uh, to, yeah. uh, 40, 44. Oh, so, so you were a fair, uh, because, because like, okay, so Max Verstappen is what? He's about... 19 or 20 but this so you can you can do this racing when you're a bit older no more yeah you can uh and sp- sports car racing it, it, people tend to be older um the single seaters that right. the young kids and the sports car racing which is what i did tend to be uh, a little bit older but you still get some uh, you know it's mainly still young guys that are doing it right right and okay so i've asked you the more which is which is really interesting i wanted to ask you about um oh hang on let me just get rid of uh, yes you can <laughs> so i'm just getting a question from my from my editor there um uh yeah in order to get to a position where you could run you could have your own team racing racing man run le mans you had to make loads of money tell me just take me back to your childhood and how how lots of people want to know this how do rich people get rich how did you do it from the start? <laughs> there, there, there was a great quote. I think it, it was John Paul Getty, and, uh, and and someone said they asked him the same question. You know, how do people get rich? And he said it's simple. He said some folk find oil and others don't, <laughs> which I thought was the best answer to that question I've ever heard. My story was a bit different. Um, I had my my mum pushed me into into getting jobs. So she'd all, yeah. she'd, often she would come home and say, oh, I've got you a job doing a paper round, and I'd be about 11 or 12 or something. So my first job actually was delivering newspapers to a hospital ward um, when I was about 11, I think. And it was hideous. Yeah, it was absolutely horrible. I, I, I hate hospitals to this day. Um, so that was that. And then she, then she got me a job in a garage, and then she got me a job on the cheese and egg stall in Chelmsford Market when I was about 14 and I worked there for four years uh, and it was it was yeah. great I thoroughly enjoyed it bloody hard work so I was doing 12 hours a day that's a lot when you were how old 14 so I would okay, do so you had a work ethic 
Yeah, I had a work ethic. I wouldn't necessarily say it was voluntary, but my mum just made me do it. So I just did. <laughs> and I must right. admit, I enjoyed it. And the guy I worked for, a guy called Mark, he was only about 21, 22. And, uh, and I, started him, I started off with him when the stand was like really small. We didn't have very many customers. And then it, it just got really, really busy. So I saw someone young making quite a lot of money just from having this really simple business. And I suppose somehow that, I didn't think about it at the time, but I guess that just got into me. Um, I've, always, I've always enjoyed numbers, like really from a very early age, um, I've liked numbers. I'm not particularly good at, well, I'm awful at maths, to be honest with you, but I'm quite good at arithmetic. So that all helps. Um, I'm a contrarian. Uh, you know, we probably both are. So that helps. Yeah, you know, we, we got that, yep. Yeah, you don't tend to run with the crowd, so that helps. Um, I don't like being told what to do, so I'm, I'm basically unemployable. <laughs> um, so yes, I suppose uh, it, like, like me. It, yeah, I, I guess it's, in the end, it becomes necessity, doesn't it? And, and it, it was necessity for me. I, I, uh, I actually lost my, I was do, doing a sales job when I was about 20. I was selling photocopies and fax machines. And... Uh, and we went out for, um, like we did every Thursday after a sales meeting, we went out and got drunk in uh, Mr. Smith's in Warrington. Really. I don't know if it's still there. But, um, and then we would drive home, you know, those were the days. And of course, one day it was my day to get pulled over by the local constabulary. Got done for drink driving, lost my driving license. Um, so then I couldn't sell anymore. So I thought, uh, you know, well, I'll go on the dole and, um, and, and did that. And then pretty quickly ran out of money, you know, really quickly. Um, and after about a year, uh, I had no money at all. I had like three months in arrears with a little mortgage that I had. Credit card debt up to me, I had literally nothing. And, uh, and I thought, well, I've got to do something. And the only thing I knew how to, to do other than sell uh, was to do accounts, basic accounts. So I put a little advert in the local paper in Manchester where I was living, a place called Denton. Um, and uh, just saying, you know, I'll do your accounts for whatever, what, 99 pounds. And uh, three weeks after I put the advert in, I got a phone call from a lady called Jenny Watts, who was a florist. And uh, she said, well, I need someone to do my accounts. So of course, I did the accounts, got my £99, um, gave me some money to put, uh, put an advert in the paper the following week, put the advert in. Somebody phoned up, a guy called Brian Miller. He was a builder. And he said, I'm in the middle of a tax investigation. He said, Are you, uh, uh, can you do them? I said, yeah, funny enough, I'm a specialist at tax investigations. Uh, which I never, never did. That's true. Clue. No, I, <laughs> no, I didn't have a clue. I, this tells you how long ago it was. I actually had to go down the library and research it. Um, and, and lo and behold, we went to the meeting with the tax office and we won. So he was delighted. I got my £500 that way. That was all the money in the world. And that was where, um, that was where SJD Accountancy was born. Uh, like I said, that was 92. And, and I sold it in 13 for... 2013 for 81 million or 82 million or something so that well, was hang on. Well, most most accountancy firms don't sell for 81 million what what what's the the usp I, i'll be honest no accountancy firm i'm really proud of this this was the the largest sale of an accountancy firm in the uk anyway ever of, of, of a privately owned yeah. accountancy firm it was just me no, no partners no nothing all organic growth, oh, which I was really, God. really, really proud of. You know, we never bought anyone. So the 14,000 clients that we had were all earned one by one by one, you know, over the years. So uh, it's something I'm really proud of. Um, so the USP was, was that we, there was a lot of clients. They, they were all paying monthly by, um, by direct debit. Um, and of course, it was thrown off a lot of cash and it was very profitable. So a private equity company um, identified it and, and bought it. So yeah, it, it wasn't. Uh, it certainly wasn't your typical accountancy firm by any means. It was. It was as far from being typical as you can as you can imagine. H had you had any sort of formal training as an accountant? Well, I'd worked for twelve months in an accountancy firm when I was eighteen. Um, but <laughs> that's I, it. Yeah, yeah. And then, in, so I started in ninety two, and I, you sort of learn it as you go along. And uh, in ninety ninety seven. I actually qualified as a chartered tax advisor because tax was something that, that interested me. So funny enough, I never ever qualified as an accountant. I had literally no accountancy qualifications whatsoever. But I, I did, you know, I did qualify as chartered uh, chartered tax advisor, which is harder. Anybody will tell you that. <laughs>
that's 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 amazing um that is that is a really good uh, presumably your parents were not particularly rich no we just had we weren't poor we just had a normal upbringing uh, i lived in uh, you know it's typical for those times three bed semi in, in chelmsford in essex and uh, i can't say i wanted for anything you know so perfectly normal childhood right yeah, remarkable and now you li- and now you live in monaco which is just like full of incredibly rich people i mean isn't that isn't that a bit weird just being surrounded by multi-millionaires do they do, do people sort of eye each other others cars up and things or you know does everyone know how much everyone else is worth secretly it's it's really funny actually that and that is absolutely the the uh, sort of preconception of what it is and is what we were expecting when, when we came here but the fact is is that there are you know, per, per capita, there are a lot of rich people here, but most people here are kind of well off rather than being really rich. So, uh, right. so that was quite interesting, you know, to, to start off with. And, uh, you know, a lot of people come here and it, and it just about works for them. So it, it's not like, you know, everybody's worth 100 million or something like that. And then in terms of the kind of the one upmanship, um, we see way less of that in Monaco than we did, for example, in Gerard's Cross, you know, so when we lived in right. Gerard's Cross, you know, everybody was trying to, out, or not everybody, but, you know, people trying to outdo each other and look at each other and jealous and this and that, and the mums at the school gate all trying to get done up more than the next and all this. In Monaco, you pretty, pretty quickly realise that you look an absolute tit if you try and do that, because the person that you're sat next to who's in a scruffy pair of jeans and, you know, hasn't shaven or whatever else it might be, it might well be a billionaire. Um, and so you don't tend to have this kind of showing off uh, mentality that, that if, if ever that's in you, that gets beaten out really quickly, really quickly. Because chances are there's somebody in the room who's worth an awful lot more than you are. So uh, everybody actually coexists really well, you know. it's um, You mix with who you want to mix with. Um, you know, they're friendly. G- generally speaking, people have an interesting story as to why they're here. Um, it's actually a really, really lovely place to live. It's safe. It's calm. It's quiet, relatively. Um, it's The weather's nice. Yeah, there's really nothing, you know, to knock it. Obviously, the tax is, is nice. Um, I still pay tax. I was going to ask you that. What, what is the tax rate in Monaco? Well, the tax on personal... Uh, 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 personal income, provided it's not earned in Monaco, is nothing, you know, there is zero tax. Um, but of course, the, if you own companies in whatever country, so mine are mainly in the UK, then your companies pay tax. So the tax advantage is, is not really as great as as people think. Um, you know, they think, oh, you know, Branson doesn't pay any tax because he's in NECA and all that. And it, it's not true. Branson personally might not pay any tax, but his companies do pay a lot of tax. And it's the same for everybody. Do you- do you pay capital gains tax in Monaco? Uh, no, no capital gains tax. That's good. So I'm thinking, you know, because I, 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 I'm obviously thinking for my imaginary future um, when I've suddenly become rich. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm looking at low tax zones. So Monaco, you're thinking, is one. I mean, France, obviously, is going to be completely stuffed, as you say. It, it's going to go socialist, isn't it? I mean, Germany, what, where do you think that's going to end up when it all when it all goes tits up? Do you think Germany will be OK? They had Not such to a live in, obviously. <laughs> oh, good God, no. Um, no. They had such a such a thriving economy beforehand, didn't they? I mean, you know, yeah. people are still going to need cars, and whether those cars are powered with electric or manure or whatever they're powered with, you know, they're still going to build cars. They have robust engineering businesses. They have a, a, a good work ethic. It'd be difficult to see Germany falling, wouldn't it? You know. You say that, Simon, that, but just uh, actually on that on that point about the German motor industry, it has been dying on its feet as a result of all this all this green policy, hasn't it? That 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 they're really struggling in this world where where governments are sort of steering us towards electric cars, even though the electric cars th- there aren't enough power points, there isn't enough. Yeah, you know, it, it it just it's not a go at the moment. So we're in this crazy environment where they're really suffering. Yeah, they've suffered, but then there's such enormous companies with such enormous cash reserves that it doesn't matter. You know, they can shift the focus of their business. If um, the government suddenly outlawed petrol cars tomorrow, 
it wouldn't take them a huge amount of time to start churning out electric cars. So yes, they'll be impacted, um, but uh, difficult, difficult really to see them being anything other than successful. Um, will the profits be as great as they were? No, but then when you think Volkswagen were making what twelve billion a year or something, you know, even if they half that, it's still not bad, is it? You know, they employ. Yeah, I suppose that's that's not. Um, so no, I, I, Germany, I think fine, but then when you look at you know France, uh, Italy, Spain. I mean, most European economies were suffering anyway, weren't they, before all this kicked in? Uh, it, 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 it is a worry. It is a worry. But, um, I haven't asked you the very important question. What kind of car have you got? A Range Rover. <laughs> you won't expect oh, have you? Has yeah. it got tinted windows? <laughs> yes, but not overly tinted, which would be illegal. Right. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, like like not not a sort of Kenneth Noy type. type. <laughs> Do you remember Kenneth Noy, the 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 Brinks Matt robber, who then got killed somebody in a road rage incident? I always think of Kenneth Noy when I see a a, a Range Rover with with blackened windows. I always think think of a, a crim. So um yeah, I suppose I wouldn't think this because because I, I'm very much of your party but i imagine some people are going to be thinking yeah but who's this rich wanker in monaco trying to interfere with with the decisions of our of our noble boris johnson and his government uh what would be your response to that uh well thank god someone is you know this isn't (laughs) this isn't something i really particularly wanted to do um and i was surprised that no one had done it it really did surprise me actually the longer it went on it was yeah. like surely something someone's going to do something so you know they might might be thanking me now but perhaps uh, i think history will, will will if it even if it thinks about me at all i think history would view, view me quite kindly um uh, you know when the statistics come out look in, in all likelihood when we get to the end of this year 2020 the number of deaths overall in the uk will probably be slightly up on the five-year average and probably somewhere in line with the 20-year average. That's the bare facts of it. But we'll have an economy that's got a trillion dollar hole in it. And, you know, put that in perspective, I think, was it 12 years of austerity? Again, I use inverted comments on that. uh, Saved, what was it, 100 billion? You know, so extrapolate the figures. We got a lot of paying off to do. Oh, my God. So that's 120 years. If I'm if I'm doing my maths right there, go on, you do the maths. You're you're the accountant, not me. Do, how many years is it going to take us to, of, of austerity? Is it going to take us to pay back a trillion dollars of, of debt? <laughs> too many, way too many. We'll all we'll all be dead by the yeah. time. There'll still be there'll still be coronavirus bombs knocking about when we're uh, when we're probably in our second or third lives for sure. Do you not think that maybe? Well, I think I think you kind of hinted at this before that the best thing that that, that comes out of this this judicial review won't be so much the government capitulating, which I'm I'm, I'm sure they'll find a way of of you know of, of winning this one, but it might open up the processes of the of the Sage Committee. We might finally see the extremely dubious processes by which these decisions were were, were reached and how haphazard the process was. I'm, I'm really hoping that we get them in. You know, we, we've asked for them in, in the letter. We've asked to be provided with them. And it would be very difficult for them, I think, to make the argument that they shouldn't um, shouldn't give them up in discovery because they're key to it. And, and if you're asking the British people to do something so costly to life and, and to the economy um, in unprecedented measures, then why on earth are you keeping back uh, the information that you are that you've relied upon to make that decision that's extraordinary i mean even the stuff some of the stuff that they that they've released subsequent to our letter um, has been redacted <laughs> what are you redacting you know is is it the the information is worse than is already out there well, christ how much worse can it get so uh, you've got you've got to think that there's going to be more than um, the more than poor old Neil getting thrown under the bus. And I think when, you know, the inquiry is going to be announced and it will go on for, what do we think, two years or three years or something like that. And uh, and I'm sure at the end of it, you know, there'll be findings that suggested that these people, you know, were no good and this should have been done differently and all the rest of it. 
Um, but like you say, I'm, I'm sure the government will find a way of, of, of coming out of this. And, and they can just simply by you know, you know, saying, have the courage to say, you know what? It's time for us to lift the lockdown. There's no point in doing a stage lockdown or a, you know, just a little, uh, a little bit here and there. It's not going to make any difference. We know that the peak has passed. Uh, we know that lockdown probably doesn't work very well anyway. The information is out there. People are scared stiff to go out. People who are over the age of 75 and got three pre-existing conditions are probably not likely to be out jogging in the park anyway. Um, and the only reason for doing a stage um, uh, release of the lockdown is so that they look, it appears as though there's some scientific evidence to what they're doing. Because otherwise you'll be in the situation of saying, well, it was, you know, we can't do anything today, but we can do everything tomorrow. How does that work? Much better politically, yes. you know, to just say, well, no, we just need to ease into it gently just to make sure. Because it kind of validates their, their process to date, doesn't it? And I would love Boris just to stand up and go, you know what, guys, it's time. We're opening up the UK. A bit like, you know, a bit like Trump does in America. Be a cheerleader. Go, we've done it. You know, we've done it. We've broken it, guys. Let's get back to work. Let's do this thing. I think the British people would love it. I really do. Uh, has he got the courage to do that? No, you know, I mean, you've got to feel for the guy. He was in an almost possible, an almost impossible situation, I think, at the start, you know, when lockdown was imposed. Uh, then the poor old sod gets it. Um, so he's been out of action for a couple of weeks. And now he's had personal experience. And he was, like I've heard from people that know, he was really, really poorly. Um, and you think, well, that's got to take... Yes, he was. It's got to take his decision-making process, hasn't it? So you've got to feel through it. And, and I'm, honestly, this isn't a political thing. This is not having a pop at the government. It's having a pop at government in general. Um, it, you, know, yeah. it, you know what I mean? It's, it's the process. It's the fact that a few people can cause such mass devastation across the board for apparently the wrong reasons. Um, so I, I am hopeful. I am hopeful. Yes. Do you not do you not rather feel, though, that that um, we're doomed to carry on down this this ridiculous path because the government is too embarrassed to do what you like them to do, which is, you know, come on. Uh, uh, we cocked up, basically. I mean, that's what they should be doing, isn't it? They're saying, look, we, we, we were sold some dodgy advice by this geezer who turned out to be a kind of a roving shagger who broke the lockdown. And um, uh, <laughs> um, no, they need to distance themselves. Well, they will, of course. Um, you know, and that, it's, you can hear his speech on Sunday. Why is he doing the speech? Well, we know why, but he's doing the speech on Sunday as opposed to Thursday. So he can grandstand and he doesn't get lost in the news over the, uh, over the long weekend. Why are you wasting three days? If you're going to lift lockdown, say it on, on the Thursday, on the day that you said you were going to do it. Not say, yes, I'm going to release, I'm going to uh, give some measures for lockdown, but on Sunday. Oh, for Christ's sake, have you not, like, has it not gone on long enough? Two and a half billion every yeah. day. What's another seven and a half billion between friends? You know, it's... Uh, it's ludicrous. But like you say, the, the likelihood of them just going, well, hey, you know, we can all go and do whatever we want is, is, is zero, uh, sadly. It's zero. Before we go, tell me, what has the lockdown been like in Monaco? Has there been one even? Uh, yeah, there has been lockdown. And it was, um, it was finished on uh, May the 4th. So what was that, a couple of days ago? Um, yeah. And... Uh, yeah, honestly, <laughs> it's funny that there's, uh, oh God, this is going to sound awful, but, but, but indulge me. So, you know, a week ago there was dolphins, dolphins playing in the sea outside, you know, we're watching them from the apartment. Uh, the sea is crystal clear, the air is beautiful, the weather's nice, it's quiet, the birds are cheeping around an awful lot more than they used to be, the fish are swimming around in the ocean, there's loads of them swimming, it's like an aquarium, you know. Um, there's no boats belching out loads of smoke, there's no helicopters going up. Um, it's beautiful. It's absolutely lovely. The only problem is, of course, is is that you can't not eat, basically. You know, in, in the end, you have to go out and do something and earn money, which means that you can then, uh, you know, go out and feed your children and, and all the rest of that stuff. Um, so, yes, whilst it's pleasant, in the same way as going on holiday and lying on a beach is pleasant, it, it's not the way you would want to spend the rest of your life. And honestly, they've handled it very well here. You know, it's a small country. So, uh, so it's a lot easier to do. Uh, but he's lifted the uh, he lifted the lockdown as soon as he thought 
um, it, it was safe to do so, which is you know a lot sooner than others. Um, and now life is not back to normal. You have to wear one of those soppy masks in the shops. Um, so I just don't go into the shops. You know, my wife does all that. So. Are, are, are the restaurants open? No, they're going to be open toward the end of the month, I believe. But in good old capitalist spirit, you know, during the uh, during the lockdown, all the restaurants just did takeout. So you'd get your your right. Mr. Service app, and you could order from any of the restaurants. So you know they have managed to keep going. But it will have an impact on the economy here for sure, because you know the Grand Prix. I mean, for example, which was cancelled, that brings in enormous amounts of tourism money. All the hotels are shut here, so they they've lost out. So it'll suffer. It'll suffer for sure. But you know it, it's not been as bad for example as france and italy and so on right well simon it's been great talking to you and listen i really really hope your campaign goes well i'm, I'm gonna obviously put down a link to where people can support your your crowdfund um i think people would like to participate even if the, you know they know you, you can afford it on your own but i think people want to do their bit yeah, that's, that's lovely. Thank you, James. I mean, any uh, anything is it's really nice and lovely to see the little messages that pop up as well. They do they do make my day actually. It's nice to see and, and go back on. Um, and next, yeah, next well, thing. Apart from the one thing, you're throbbing. Yeah, well, you're like a big throbber. Maybe. <laughs> Listen, maybe it was a compliment. I don't know. Maybe I took it out of context. <laughs> it was the fact that she called me a cunt just beforehand probably gave it away. But. <laughs> 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 yeah well good on that note um great so you're listening to uh, simon dolan and uh, uh, i hope you support simon's simon's crowdfund for this judicial review against the ridiculous lockdown policy thank you very much and goodbye thanks James.